Good. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I guess, uh, is it uh, on? Oh, yeah, it's on. Good. Great. Thanks. All right. Good morning. It's the first day. So let's get uh, start. Uh, let's get the school starting. I'm Eiichiro Komatsu from Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics in Gahin. That's the northern suburb of Munich. And uh, I'm going to tell you about the cosmic microwave background. And I put all the lecture notes here in this website. It's complicated URL, so you just find my website by uh, web searches and then follow the lectures and reviews link, then you can have all the PDFs of my lectures, not only from this school, but from all the other ones as well. So uh, if you wanted to follow my lectures more closely, then please uh, download these and enjoy. So planning is that uh, we, we have, uh, so I have four lecture slots. 75 minutes each, that's a lot. So today I'm going to give you some brief introduction of the CMB research. CMB stands for Cosmic Microwave Background. Then I'll tell you how you get anisotropies in the CMB from gravitational effects. Then I'll tell you what the power spectrum means once and for all, you understand what the power spectrum is. Then tomorrow we're going to talk about sound waves. And that's a big topic, so I'll dedicate the whole day just to that. Then uh, on Wednesday, we, have, we, we learn uh, how this power spectrum depends on various cosmological parameters. Then we dive into the polarization of the cosmic micro background. And the last day, that's Thursday, we finish on polarization and tell you about what's most exciting thing at the moment, which is the cosmic micro background polarization and temperature anisotropies from gravitational waves. Okay, so that's the plan. And uh, I guess, um, you know, I know how students feel. Uh, they, you know, you're all shy. You, you never uh, dare to ask any questions, maybe during the lectures, but uh, after lectures, I'm, I'm all, you know, I'm free. Even if I'm doing something, interrupt me because I'm not really doing anything useful. <laughs> I'm just pretending that I'm doing something, okay? So if you find me, ask any questions, please, please. I love, I love questions. Uh, these are actually not only useful for you, but also useful for lecturers. So sometimes you, people ask very good questions. And uh, uh, yeah, I don't want to be sort of idle, you know, <laughs> doing use, use, useless things. So I'd rather, I'd rather talk to you guys. Okay, so anytime, please. Okay, so let, let the universe begin. Uh, I'm, let's see if the uh, light is uh, dim enough. So we have this situation where when the universe was born, it was very opaque because density is so high and temperature was so high that the electrons were free and the electrons are very good at the scattering cosmic microwave background photons by Thomson scattering. So you cannot see anything, it's like the uh, center of the sun. But once temperature, the universe expands and the universe cools down, when temperature drops to about 3,000 kelvins, the universe became transparent because electrons are now combined with protons to form neutral hydrogen atoms. Neutral hydrogen atoms do scatter photons, but not as much as Thomson scattering. And so you can start seeing the universe throughout. And you see that, you now see some kind of proto galaxies, the small things. And uh, um, we will learn from uh, a lecture by Professor Sheth that in a standard kind of cosmology scenario, the structure formation proceeds such that small things form first, the small things merge to be, form bigger and bigger structures. But one thing that's super important, which is not really the topic of today's lecture, or my lecture, but it will be the topic of the uh, lecture by Professor Clevan on inflation, namely, in order to form these beautiful structures, you really had to have initial fluctuations. You remember that when I first started this movie, universe was already pretty inhomogeneous, right? It was not completely homogeneous. When universe has a fireball stage, you already have some fluctuations. Where do they come from? That's a big question. We, I think we know the answer, where they came from. And uh, you have to wait until Professor Clevan's lecture for that. So uh, that's a bit of a spoiler. These are all cartoons, and I just skip. 
So, what is cosmic microwave background? You saw this opaque universe, hot, bright universe. Where do these photons go now? Where are they? They are, where did they go? Actually, they, did, they didn't go anywhere. If you look at the sky in the optical night sky, that's the sky you see, but if you look at night sky, or actually day sky as well, it doesn't matter, at one millimeter, wavelength, that's where you see, okay? So these photons are still with us, and this is what we call the cosmic microwave background. The temperature of the photon, due to the expansion, has cooled down to something like three Kelvin, so that's pretty cold, but nonetheless, this is the most numerous particles in the universe. 410 photons per cubic centimeter, which doesn't sound like a lot, because when you are on Earth, the best vacuum you have ever achieved is much, much, you know, has much more particles than this. But if you go to just other, the reason for that is that on Earth, matter has clumped together so much that now we are living in this matter-dominated world on Earth. But if you go to the average location in the universe and ask, how many atoms are there compared to how many photons, okay? And I tell you that for every atom, let's say hydrogen atom, there are two billion photons from the cosmic microwave background. That's kind of amazing, right? So th these are by far the most numerous particles in the universe, and we don't actually know why that's so. That's another interesting subject. So, how do you detect those things? Well, you need to have the radio antenna because these uh, microwave photons are now uh, distributions peaking at about uh, two millimeters. So you need to have, you can't use optical telescopes. You need to use radio telescopes. Well, we have a very good radio telescope. Everybody has, or well, at least everybody had. Your parents had one, at least. You have this uh, uh, TV, and she is the, uh, one of my colleagues. Uh, we work together for WMAP Satellite. I will tell you a bit about later. She's a professor at UCL now. So she holds this uh, TV. When you have static noise, when you're not tuning it to any broadcasting programs, then you see static noise. And in, in, in fact, 1% of that noise is due to this cosmic microwave background. So it doesn't really take much to see it. Um, of course, if you really wanted to see, you need to do something better. In 1965, indeed, these two gentlemen, uh, Penjas and Wilson, discovered this cosmic micro background by an accident. I'll tell you how that works. But before that, let me show you this uh, one in 25th model of the antenna. You just saw in the picture, so that's fully moving. Uh, this is the exhibited in the third floor of the Deutsche Museum in Munich one of the best science museums in the world. This is just to show that this stuff moves, right? So uh, it moves, therefore you can point this to anywhere in the sky that you can see from, from Earth. Very nice. And this is the real detector system of the discovery, donated by Arno Penges because he was born in Munich. He had to, his family had to flee to uh, uh, U.S. Uh, due to the Nazism there, but uh, uh, he nonetheless kindly donated this. When I saw this in the Deutsche Museum, I almost cried. Uh, here is actually myself in reflection. I don't know if you can see it, but that's me taking a picture. <laughs> and uh, uh, so light goes from the left and comes in. Then it gets amplified here and then sent to the uh, recorder. This is exactly what radio does for you. Uh, when radio receives a signal from the uh, uh, radio transmission, it amplifies the signal so that you can hear. But the difference between your radio and this thing, which is super expensive, is what's in the middle here. So this is called calibrator. This is super cool uh, in, terms of, in terms of temperature. It's a cool technology too, but it's a... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you, you cool <coughs> material to five Kelvin by liquid helium. And what you want to do is to measure the temperature of the sky. So these two gentlemen wanted to measure the temperature of the sky for radio astronomical purposes, not CMB, because CMB wasn't known. So what you do, you take the signal from the sky, then you take the signal from the calculator with known temperature, you compare the signal and you know how, how, what the temperature the sky has. Because otherwise, 
you see the record, and you don't know what the units are. Voltage or something, but you want to know the temperature, right? So you switch the input between calibrator and antenna, and that's the result. So uh, on May 20th, 1964, uh, when Penjas and Wilson pointed the antenna to the sky for the first time, they immediately saw the problem, okay? So this time, time flows from bottom to up. Intensity of the signal goes up to the right. And I want you to pay attention to this dip here, which means the coldest. It says cold something. That's the calculator. This is 5 Kelvin. Then here, you see elevation 90 degrees, which means zenith. And zenith is clearly brighter than the calculator. But that's weird, because it shouldn't be brighter. Um, the zenith temperature at seven centimeter wavelengths that they're making measurements was known to be two Kelvin, 2.3 Kelvin. But the measure of the signal was 6.7 Kelvin, okay? And if you look at the noise here, this fluctuation here, it's much, much smaller than the signal you measure. It's a booming signal, right? So what's, what's going on here? And antenna itself also emits something that's 0.8 Kelvin, and everything else has been limited to be less than 0.1. So if you do the subtraction, you get 3.5 plus minus 1.0, this plus minus 1.0, as you can see, doesn't come from statistical fluctuation. This comes from the knowledge of the zenith temperature and antenna temperature, so everything else. So this is what we call completely systematics limited experiment. Okay? You are not limited by statistics. No matter how long you make a measurement, that doesn't matter. Noise doesn't average down. It's all limited by your systematic uncertainty in the knowledge of the zenith temperature and antenna temperature, and that's the detection. So what, what's that, what, what is this thing? They didn't know, so they called up the professors in Princeton and figured out that it was coming from, perhaps from the fireball universe. Of course, just one measurement at single frequency doesn't tell you much. You need to make lots of measurements at various frequencies to figure out that this thing really comes from the fireball universe. Why? Because these measurements are consistent with Planck spectrum, which is the spectrum of the fireball, right? So uh, you want to create ion by heating the ion stones. And uh, well, previously, for example, in, in Germany, uh, when people are really crazy about uh, ions, it's an important thing, what happened was that uh, these uh, workers, these uh, experts, look at the fire and say, hmm, 1,000 Kelvin, 1,500 Kelvin, 1, Kelvin, right? That's what they did. Maybe 1,200, blah, blah, blah. But then they realized that this is kind of not very efficient. So physicists were given the task, including Planck, to figure this out. And they discovered that fireball emits very specific spectrum, which depends only on temperature. So once you measure this thing, you don't need uh, experts anymore, what we call Meister in, in German. So all these Meisters are fired. And now you hire physicists. Okay, that's very good. <laughs> all right, so this is a very, very important curve for Germany and for the rest of the world, of course. And as you can see, uh, this curve depends only on temperature. Uh, yellow is 2 Kelvin, magenta is 4 Kelvin, but it's neither 4 Kelvin nor 2 Kelvin, it's 2.725 Kelvin most precise thing that we measure in the cosmology. All right, now let me entertain you by showing uh, some movie here. Uh, this is a rather remarkable thing. I really uh, enjoyed uh, working with director Kosaka, who is the uh, very famous movie director who creates a movie for full dome, like Planetarium. He doesn't create Planetarium. He creates movie, but it's a movie projected on the full dome. And uh, there was this uh, Freedom Festival in, in uh, Czech, uh, this city here. I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, but uh, this movie won the best movie award ju just uh, very recently, and I'm very proud of that. So why did we create this movie? So this is a movie, I think the first ever movie, certainly for Freedom, movie dedicated to CMB research. 
Okay? And this is already shown. This is the English version. We already have Japanese version too, and that's already shown at the multiple cities in Japan. And that's it's a very nice thing. So how, how we did this uh, is, I think, a bit quite, quite educational. So uh, let me just share the story. You know that uh, we, we scientists all want to give back to taxpayers what we have learned using their money. So we go to schools or go to museum or whatever to give lectures. And that's nice. I mean, people get to see us directly. Uh, but then what we did uh, a few years ago was that uh, we actually did the public lectures only for science communicators. So uh, journalists, uh, movie directors, musicians, artists, and people working, uh, curators working at the museum and so forth. And it turns out that this was very effective because we t say to them something and get them excited, they themselves go out and do the exact same thing el elsewhere. And uh, this is one to come, and he created a movie out of it. <laughs> so let me show you. And in, now you have to imagine, uh, unfortunately, we don't have a dome. We can project the whole thing. So you have to imagine that, that what you're seeing is actually projecting a full dome. In 1989, the cosmic background radiation probe, COBE, was launched into space. Observations from outer space without disturbance by the atmosphere brought about a remarkable discovery. The spectrum of the cosmic background radiation matched the theoretical expectation of the Planck distribution. But the best was yet to come. The shape of this curve depends on the temperature of matter that emitted light. Using this property, the temperature of the cosmic background radiation was found to be minus 270.4 degrees Celsius. Meaning 2.7 Kelvin. However, <laughs> in detail, these curves vary slightly from place to place. That is, the temperature of the cosmic background radiation has fluctuations. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So let me show another. So here I am. So that's me. And uh... when I heard about the map proposal, I really wanted to become a this member of the team. This is a professional voice actor, so clearly it's not my voice. <laughs> I left Japan and came here, waiting for my chance. A year and a half later, the map was launched six months behind the schedule. I finally became a member of the map team when the data from map started to arrive. The map improved upon the Kobe in many ways and succeeded in measuring temperature fluctuations of the cosmic background radiation with 35 times better angular resolution. So that's what the WMAP did and uh, we're going to learn all about it. So this is the science team of the WMAP collaboration. Uh, this is the PI, uh, Charles Bennett. He's a professor at Johns Hopkins now. And uh, this is the Professor Wilkinson at Princeton, who is the father of this, this mission. He unfortunately passed away just before the data release in 2003. Then uh, we decided to, so as you saw, that the project was initially called MAP, Microwave Anisotropy Probe, but we decided to uh, call this now Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe in honor of Professor Wilkinson. OK, so here's the Milky Way. And uh, let's, let's sort of get used to this full sky map of the cosmic micro background. It's called galactic projection. We were surrounded by sky, 360 degrees, but uh, we wanted to show everything on the screen, therefore you need to expand it around. Now you will go to uh, longer wavelengths from the optical. Now first thing is the near infrared, then far infrared, some millimeter, but by the time you go to microwave, centimeter, microwave, mi uh, millimeter kind of thing, sky is filled with cosmic micro background, completely uniform. But when you then 
uh, improve the sensitivity of the instrument by a factor of 100,000 times, you start seeing these ripples. So these are the ripples that existed during the fireball universe. So that's, that's our origin in a way, right? We all came from there. The cosmic background radiation right. was predicted as a consequence of the expansion of the universe. The beginning of the universe was like a dense ball of fire. Everything was immersed in light. It was just like the center of the sun. Like a fog where light couldn't travel straight. However, when the universe cooled down due to expansion, the fog cleared and light could travel farther. Shouldn't this Ron light is reach the, one the of Earth the first today? Who predicted the existence of CMB? This light gives us the oldest picture of the universe that we can ever see directly. But the wavelength of this light has been stretched by the expansion of the universe. And it has gone past visible light and turned into microwaves. Microwaves that come from every direction at once. That's the evidence for the expansion of the universe. So we have this something called lasso scattering surface because you have, where do these photons come from, right? So they were scattered by electrons until the universe became as cool as 3,000 kelvins. After that, light pretty much propagated freely. So that's then the epoch that we see photons, right? So this is so called lasso scattering surface. So we're surrounded by the surface, and it they took 13.8 billion years to reach us today. Light that was emitted here has already gone past us, so you don't see them. Does that make sense? It's very important, okay? So when the universe has a fireball, of course, every location emitted the light. And we're here now, and photon that was emitted then, there already has gone past us, right? But light that was emitted far away, far away, finally reached us after 13.8 billion years. And if we wait for a few more years, well, you know, billions of years, we can see a bit, bit further. The photons come from a bit further, right? Does, does it make sense? Okay, it's a very important concept. So that's, the, that's what we do. Uh, the things we, are, we don't, do not cover during this lecture, although important topics, uh, sorry. Uh, so tomorrow, we're, we're going to learn how Photons propagate in a clumpy universe today. Tomorrow, we're going to learn how the universe back then was just like a soup. So you drop the stone into the soup and ripples are created and how, how they might come up in the CMB. That's the tomorrow's topic, it's a big topic. Stay tuned. Things that are not, not covered by this lecture, although important topics are, when, when the photons propagate, they get deflected actually by gravitational lensing. So they also imprint important signatures in CMB. We don't cover that. It's an important thing, but we don't cover. Also, and photons hit like a galaxy cluster or even galaxies, which have lots of gas in it. They get scattered again and gain or lose energy depending upon the, what they do. And they create a signature like that. You can see in the sky, you can use this kind of signature to, to detect Galaxy clusters, this is called Suniak Zerodovich effect, and we don't talk about that, although it's an important topic. So, uh, for today's lecture, uh, actually, for my lecture entirely, I'm going to follow the not notation in the book, uh, Cosmology by Steven Weinberg. So, before I moved to uh, Munich, I was a professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and uh, Steve was writing the book at that time when I was arrived, so we talk, about, talk a lot about it. So he converted uh, me into using his notation. Moreover, I translated this book into Japanese. And uh, it's funny, but uh, when we translate anything written in English into Japanese, the volume doubles. <laughs> so this is a thing called, it's the it's first, first volume. We have a second volume as well. And uh, yeah, I'm very proud of that. All right. And as for the cosmological parameters, uh, so uh, for, for those who are not yet familiar with this, 
The cosmological parameters basically characterize the uh, background cosmology. So omega lambda is a fractional energy density in dark energy today. This value changes over the time, but uh, today, 70% of energy density in this mysterious form of dark energy. 4.7% is in helium and hydrogen, what we call baryons. Then uh, this D here is the uh, dark matter. Then M here is a matter, so it's total matter, uh, dark matter plus baryons. That's 0.3%, uh, sorry, 30% today. And if you subtract uh, 0.047 from 0.3, then you get the dark matter density. Okay? And we have the present day expansion rate, uh, which in this funny unit, so if you place galaxy at one megaparsec away, then it's moving away from us at 68 kilometers per second. That's what that means. If you place the 100 megaparsec, it will be 6,800 kilometers per second uh, moving away from us. So that's the numbers we're gonna use. And uh, so how light propagates in the clumpy universe? Let's figure this out. So how do we do this? Uh, matter curves space-time. So let's see how that works. In this uh, world we live, within this room, if you look, don't look too far outside, you don't notice that the Earth is a sphere. So everything is flat, Euclidean, and you describe the Cartesian coordinates Distance between two points, two neighboring points, let's say here, dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. That's a distance, you know, dx, dy, dz. Sure, that's fine, move on. Now, since the universe is expanding, we multiply the whole thing by something that depends only on time. And because the universe expands in a homogeneous and isotropic way, the A factor there doesn't depend on location, or direction, okay? That's already an assumption. We call this scale factor, and A doesn't have any unit, so it's not really physical quantity, but it just describes how universe expands. So A basically grows over time. Now, let me write this in a fancy way, like that. So now, I equals one is X, I equals two is Y, I equals three is Z, and you have this Kronecker delta, Delta ij is one when i equals j, but uh, zero otherwise. This is just a fancy way of writing this thing, right? Great. Then I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something remarkable, which is to make the universe curved. Here, it's no longer Kronecker delta, so you have mixture between dx, dy, dy, dz, and also the coefficients. Now this thing depends on space time. So, your distance between two points is no longer given by Cartesian formula. All right, that's kind of weird, but that's, that took an Einstein to figure this out. Previously, Riemann figured this out, but the Einstein co made a connection to physics. In fact, that's how the universe works. All right, then, Einstein also told us that not only the space, the distance between space uh, changes, but also time erupses different way depending upon whether you're in a gravitational field or not. And this phi here is a Newtonian's gravitational potential, everybody's favorite. This is minus gm over r, Newtonian. And this is a spatial scalar curvature perturbation because it multiplies the spatial element of the uh, distance between two, two points. We call this curvature perturbation, okay? And in most cases, psi is equal to phi. So this is also minus gm over r, okay? But not always. And here, this funny thing is d is called tensor metric perturbation, so this is what we call gravitational waves, okay? And once again, slides are all available on my website, so you don't have to take notes, just uh, write something on lecture notes. All right, now, what does this tensor partition do? We have conditions, uh, there's a reason why we wrote this uh, in this funny form. You have two exponentials, what's the difference between these? This D is defined such, a, such that it preserves area. 
in a way, this HIJ is a change to the uh, distance between two points, right? How do they change? This gravitational wave changes them in an area conserving manner, which me actually means the DII, sum of the I, is zero. So once you satisfy that, this describes this kind of funny looking thing. This is called gravitational waves. And here is the, uh, the rest, okay? So you took away determinant of the uh, space time so that this area conserving deformation, this deforms area, right? This change the area in the distance between two points, that's curvature perturbation. So that's mathematical way of understanding what we mean by curvature perturbation. But, but it's essentially same as phi, gravitational potential. All right, so let's do the uh, fun part. Let photons propagate in space. And what do they do? They go straight line, but the quote unquote straight lines. Space is curved, and photons try to move so that they minimize the distance between two points, called geodesics. Now if you look at the trajectory of the photons from the point of view of, let's say, someone who doesn't live in the curved space, you know, flat space, the photons appear to move in a curved trajectory, although photons think that they are moving in a straight line. Okay? So, equation motion for the uh, positions of photon, okay, and U here is the label of this trajectory here. If nothing happens, you might think that this d square x d u square should be zero, and that's correct. That's the correct intuition, right? No force, no external force. Particles move freely. Isn't it true that uh, this, this second derivative of the coordinate should be zero? And that's completely true. Only issue is that the, that equation is not invariant under coordinate transformation. Another thing Einstein told us, and actually not that Einstein, many others before, physics shouldn't depend on coordinates. How you lay out coordinates, right? I mean, who cares whether I have an x, y, z, or something else? Physics shouldn't care. So you ought to write down the equation such that it stays invariant. This form of the equation doesn't change under general coordinate transformation. And it turns out that you had to add this term here, that's a unique term. You had to add this to, to make that happen. So suddenly, Einstein tells us this is the equation for freely falling body. Okay? This gamma here, is describing gravity, okay? So gravity is, in a way, not a typical force, like electromagnetic forces. Electromagnetic forces should be put on the right-hand side. That's an external force. Gravity is not really external force in a way. It's actually is geometry. It comes from the fact that the equation of the motion has to stay invariant under generic coordinate transformation. This gamma here, Ah, and uh, let's now, because we're talking about photons and how photons might lose or gain energy as they propagate in clumpy universe, uh, let's write down this in terms of momentum, P, so that will be the derivative of x with respect to u, and this is the same equation as before, fine. Now, this thing here is complicated. But just remember that this is just the mathematics that you can figure out fairly easily, in fact. And uh, only thing you have to remember is that uh, this is nothing but photon trying to go straight line, okay? And you are trying to force this to be described in Cartesian coordinates. And that's why we have this funny thing going, you know, popping up now, right? Uh, photons don't like Cartesian coordinates, they like their own coordinates, but we like Cartesian coordinates, so we write them in terms of Cartesian coordinates. As a result, we need to have all these uh, funny terms. So, math may be messy, but physics is transparent. We require photons to travel between two points in space time with the minimum path length called geodesics. Geodesic equation contains this mathematical body called uh, affine connection. You don't have to know what that is, but it's just there to make the uh, equation uh, invariant. Then when you write down, write them down in terms of metric perturbations because we love Cartesian coordinates, you get this result. This is the rate of the change in photon momentum. As it propagates, this, uh, this uh, D derivative is the derivative along with photon. Dot 
product here is a partial derivative with respect to time fixing the uh, spatial part, okay? So, complicated, but they are very easy to understand, okay? So let's do that. So, okay, I forgot to mention, uh, of course, if you wanted to just do the math and derive everything, you don't have to come to the lecture, you just read Weinberg's book. I'm going to tell you, my spirit is that uh, I tell you how physics works. Not so much equations, despite what I've done already, right? But I hope that you realize that uh, I keep saying what equation means physically. And once you understand it, it's really satisfying, okay? Deriving equations is one thing, but understanding it is another and it gives you true satisfaction. Plus, it makes, you make sure that you got the right answer. <laughs> and if you don't understand the equation, in writing it down, you probably, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you understand anything. You probably wrote down garbage, okay? <laughs> Once you understand it, uh, it's, it's really something uh, unique. First term, it's a cosmological redshift. As the universe expands, A increases, and as the universe, for example, doubles its size, temperature of the photon halves. Or in other words, energy of the photon halves. Therefore, uh, when A doubles, P goes down by a factor of two. Cosmological redshift, there you go. Second, what is this? So, uh, if you go back to this distance between two points, we actually had not only A, but also E to the minus two psi. Multiply on dx. So locally, photon actually feels the effective scale factor, which is not A, but A tilde, which does include x e to the minus psi. And photons lose energy not just by one over A, but one over A tilde. If you do that, you get this automatically, because these two terms are essentially the same thing. Okay? All right. Now this thing here, is a gravitational redshift. You shoot photon from Earth to a satellite orbiting the Earth. Because gravitational potential is different on the surface of the Earth and right there, photons lose energy by climbing up against photon. This uh, climbing up against potential well. This is the measure of the effect. It exists, we know for sure. So let's take a look. Um, Potential well is the potential is less than zero. As you climb up against the potential well, potential increases. So along this direction, phi increases. Okay? And gamma is a photon direction moment, direction vector. So d phi dx r gamma is positive when you climb up the potential well. And overall psi is negative. Hence, photons lose energy. Okay? Just gravitational red redshift. That's gravitational waves. And let's take the coordinate system where the uh, z axis, so for the uh, gravitational waves are propagating uh, in the z axis. And they oscillate in x and y because these are uh, transverse waves, just like photons. If you take that coordinate, okay? Then let the gravitational waves do their own thing. They stretch space, this or that, or this or that, right? And squash in the other way. For example, you take plus mode. Then when the uh, photon, uh, when the H, H cross is plus, increases, photons lose energy. Now you can see that here. When H dot increases, photons lose energy. Right? So it's the same effect as this one, it's just that it happens in an anisotropic way. It doesn't happen in a spherical way. So that's how photons lose energy according to the expansion of the universe, as well as gravitational uh, potential and gravitational waves. And it's important to realize that they all have to be differentiated, okay? So no static effect will change the photon energy. For example, just having static gravitational wave that doesn't change, you know, this H doesn't change, doesn't do anything. It's always derivative, okay? And that's, that's important. So now I can integrate this equation 
formally to get a solution for a times p. Now a times p, because p goes like 1 over a, uh, you no longer have 1 over a factor here, just potentials. Okay? Or a times p is essentially the temperature, so that's what you get. Okay? And let's understand this again. Now here, we, I'm integrating this equation from today to last scattering surface, where photons came from. All right, now, what's going on here? First of all, when the photons are sitting at the gravitational potential well, bottom, bottom of the gravitational potential well at the last scattering surface, they presumably had some kind of initial condition, okay? We don't know yet. We don't know what that is yet. It's there. Now photons climb up the potential well and being redshifted. That gives you gravitational potential phi. And phi is negative for the bottom of the well, so photons lose energy. When photons come inside of our potential, photons gain energy. That's the potential in our universe. Okay? Or is this? Oh, sorry, I, I'm ahead of myself. That's gravitational redshift. This is called integrated Zucks Wolf effect, I guess. Every effect, this is neat. So if photons climb up against potential well and come to us, and when they come to us, because the universe is lumpy, they encounter other potential wells too. They re enter the potential well, they gain energy, and they leave the potential well and they lose energy. When gravitational potential is static, you lose energy, the same amount that you gained, so there's nothing in the end. There's no net change. Now, when, for example, gravitational potential actually decayed, became shallower, as photons propagate throughout the uh, gravitational potential well, then you gain energy, because you don't lose as much as you gained. So this is caused by the cumulative time-independent uh, gravitational potential effects, and this is called integrated, because it's integral, okay? Integrated is like Wolf effect, ISW. And uh, gravitational waves give you temperature and isotropy in the same way uh, through this integrated effect. I'm not talking about DIJ here, I'm sticking to the scalar functions, so these are called scalar perturbations. How about initial conditions? Were photons hot or cold at the bottom of the potential? Well, at the last of the surface, and you know, who knows? Only the data can tell us. But you can hypothesize, okay? Maybe, maybe I can come up with the uh, initial condition such that things are fluctuating, of course, but ratio of the number of densities is fixed. If you have 410 photons, you have 2 billion atoms. Take the ratio, and both, of course, baryon density and photon density vary across space, the ratio does not depend on space. Why don't we just take that? I tell you why I should do that, but uh, let's take it, okay? So, N, number density of ice uh, ingredient, ice element, divided by the number density of J element is constant, right? And let's perturb N by adding some delta n, they follow that the perturbation ith element of the number density divided by the mean density is equal to the, uh, the same ratio for another species. It holds true for all species. This is called adiabatic initial condition for the reason I tell you in the next slide, but that's the definition of adiabatic initial condition. Why, why the hell should I do that? Well, it looks, uh, uh, kind of becomes obvious when you realize that in the thermal equilibrium, Okay? Baryons and photons are exchanging energy very frequently. They have the same temperature. They, everything is determined by thermodynamics. Namely, number of photons is given by temperature cubed, so is baryon density. Right? Take the ratio, then ratio depends only on the uh, uh, fundamental constants in thermal equilibrium. So in this thermal equilibrium scenario, indeed, this adiabatic initial condition holds, and it's called adiabatic because it's adiabatic evolution of the uh, gas, right? 
If you do that, then now you know that the dn over n gamma, so the photons of number density ratio of the photon, because number density of the photon goes like t cubed, you pick up three here when you perturb, and that's the, that's the uh, answer. This is called adiabatic initial condition between baryon and temperature of the photons. Makes sense, okay? This sounds like a good idea. No? Yeah? <laughs> okay. <laughs> But how about dark matter? Should it be true for dark matter? I don't know. It's possible, you know, we, we don't see dark matter particles directly just yet. You watch some germanium metal until dark matter particles hit the germanium and deposit energy to it, and you, you know, stay at that for, for, for many years. Uh, we haven't seen anything yet. Uh, that means that the dark matter particles do not seem to interact with visible matter or photons very much. But that doesn't mean that they were not interacting at all in the early universe. They would have. It's a pure speculation, and uh, you need to uh, wait until the next lecture to tell you uh, what, 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 uh, uh, what's going on for dark matter. In the other universe, but maybe, you know, cross-section, the interaction rate may increase with energy. Cross-section has energy at the unit of uh, 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 energy square. Therefore, it's possible that as you go to um, interaction rate go, grows with energy as you go to the other universe. Who knows? Then it's possible that the dark matter particles and visible matter particles are interacting and in thermal equilibrium in the universe. If that's the case, then uh, dark matter particles and photons are also in adiabatic initial condition. But maybe dark matter particles are something called axions, which they don't really, wouldn't be thermal equilibrium. Interactions would be too weak. In that case, there's no reason whatsoever for dark matter to obey adiabatic initial condition. Then you have to really look into the data to figure out whether initial condition was adiabatic or not. If, as uh, Professor Clever might tell you next week, there was something called the inflation in the early universe, and there's only one degree of freedom, one inflaton field, that decays into everything else, so we, they, everything, origin, including dark matter and baryons, they all originate from the single field. Then maybe you can get the adiabatic condition, even if dark matter was not in thermal equilibrium with photons. So as you can see, looking at CMB data and figuring out initial condition has an enormous implication for the nature of dark matter as well. Right? But uh, it turns out as we showed, uh, the adiabatic initial condition fits data beautifully. So I'm going to assume adiabatic initial condition throughout this lecture to simplify things. OK, now, at the last of scattering surface, the temperature fluctuation is given by adiabatic relation. So t, delta t over t is now one third of the total matter density, not just baryons, total matter, including dark matter. This is far from obvious, as I told you, but let's take it, OK? Then, if you solve the Einstein's equation, you figure that delta rho m over rho m is related to uh, potential times minus 2, so that uh, in the bottom of the potential well, delta rho over rho is positive. Uh, thank you very much. And then, in this initial condition, you see, because phi is negative at the bottom of the potential well, photon is hot at the bottom of the potential well. Ah, good. Yeah, makes sense. But then, photons lose energy as they climb up, climb up a potential well. And it was two, minus 2 thirds. If you add 1, it's plus 1 third. And phi is negative. So you look at cold spot in the sky, it's actually over dense. Right? That's adiabatic initial condition. It's not obvious, right? So uh, it's really fun. And in fact, we think that uh, on the, uh, as long as you average, this is a period gradation effect. You include some other effects, it's different. 
But the gravitational effects, you know, if you look at the cold spot in the sky, that's over a dense region. Therefore, that's the place where all these stars are forming and the galaxies are forming, you know, these eventually give rise to our world. Yeah? So figuring out initial condition is kind of pretty important. Because that, that really changes the way we interpret the uh, uh, microwave background data. There you go. All right, so now let's do something better than picture, yes? Yes, yes. So, what's the temperature at the bottom of the potential well? If you assume adiabatic initial condition, I mean num number density ratio is the same everywhere, independent of space, that's the answer. Because uh, at the bottom of the potential well, density is higher, so is the temperature, okay? Now, this is something not obvious, right, because I didn't drive it, but uh, believe me, if you solve Einstein's equation, the matter density fluctuation is given by minus two times phi. So that's minus two thirds of phi. But that's the bottom of the potential well. Photons have to climb, they lose energy by plus phi. So you add one phi to this, sine flips, and you suddenly you get one third of phi plus. And because phi is negative at the bottom of the potential well, temperature is negative. Temperature fluctuation is negative. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, thanks for asking. Yeah, please, please stop me uh, if you, I'm going too fast. Yeah. So let's do something better than picture. I'm gonna Decompose these fluctuations fields into a set of sine and cosines. And take the square of the amplitude and plot them as a function of inverse wavelengths, okay? In other words, this. So uh, y-axis is the square of the amplitude of the waves. X-axis is the uh, one over wavelengths. And as you go to the right, therefore, it's a short wavelength. And as you go to the left, it's long wavelengths. And you're gonna understand everything about this tomorrow, or day after tomorrow. Uh, in, more intuitively, if you look at the leftmost panel, which is the largest angular scale, you're looking at the fluctuation in the sky, whose wavelength is as long as whole sky. But as you go to the right, you start seeing finer, finer structures, shorter, shorter wavelengths. Yeah? But of course, once you then, you're done decomposing everything you could within the angular resolution of the experiment, you combine them together, you get the original map. Nice? Let's do the analysis. So this is the uh, basement office in Princeton the University. The pattern of the cosmic Princeton, background radiation consists of no waves of many different sizes, window, both big and, and small. Legal I'm analyzing in the, in the, the waves United States, according to their wavelength. I think it's illegal in Europe. The principle <laughs> is the same as splitting light with a prism. So I'm going to split waves into a set of waves. The direction of waves is irrelevant. What's important is the strength of waves at each wavelength. Let's draw a graph with the wavelength on the horizontal axis and the strength on the vertical axis. With this graph, we can reconstruct sound waves in the universe. Wow! wow. This is the <laughs> power really spectrum like of the sound <laughs> that was there in space. space. <laughs> we can see harmonics clearly. A power spectrum is the profile of a sound. Sound waves change depending on the properties of space through which they propagate. This is the power spectrum of the piano. Analyzing the power spectrum gives us valuable information about space. Okay, let's turn this into an audible sound. sound that was traveling in space. So why are we 
calling this sound because uh, as we as become clear tomorrow, what we're seeing here is the sound waves. Uh, sorry, the uh, longitudinal waves, uh, density waves, propagating in the medium. And because the longitudinal wave, we, we call every all the longitudinal waves sound waves. Uh, that, that's the only reason. You have a pressure density that gives you these uh, density waves. Yeah. Good. So now do some some math. So this is a polar coordinate. We are sitting at the center, observing sky as a function of theta and phi. Polar coordinate theta, azimuth angle phi. Now, we, we observe temperature and isotropies and we decompose this thing, this thing into spherical harmonics. Um, usually, we use Fourier transform, but because sky is sphere, Fourier transform, which assumes Euclidean space, doesn't work. So instead, you need to decompose waves in, in terms of set of spherical waves, not plane waves. Okay? Let's take n equals one, so this is the coefficient, Fourier coefficient or spherical harmonic coefficient. You have L equals one to infinity, and M, which gives you direction of, uh, L gives you the uh, fineness of the fluctuations, frequency of fluctuations. M is a direction. You don't have to know this what M is, except to say that uh, when you have L equals one, in a particular coordinate system, theta and phi, you have to uh, fix. Then, uh, in Zenus, it's hot. In the bottom, the south, 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 south pole is cold. That's the, that's a dipole. But of course, you can also have the situation, the orthogonal basis, these are all orthogonal. They're, they're orthogonal to each other, they're independent of each other. You can also have the situation where Zenus is not hot, hot or cold. But the horizon is hot. Hot and cold. Okay? Hot, so hot, <laughs> hot back, cold front. And you have to also get used to the fact that the, these two locations are the same. Yeah? We are, uh, once again, decomposing the sphere into the, uh, projecting sphere onto the uh, screen. One cute thing is that, uh, LM coefficients actually depend on coordinate system you choose. You pick, for example, origin of the polar angle to be the galactic north. And you get set of coefficients. If you choose to uh, pick the uh, polar coordinate origin to be the uh, ecliptic coordinate north pole, the coefficient change. But the power, LM squared, averaged over M, is coordinate invariant. So it's a very convenient quantity. LMs themselves are not really convenient because they depend on coordinates. But power depend, does, is rotationally invariant. It, it, it's independent of uh, three rotation of a sphere. This is what we call power spectrum. It's useful because, it, first of all, it gives you the power of the fluctuation, it's a variance, but also it's independent of the coordinate system. Okay. Let's move on, L equals two. It divides the sky into four, hot, cold, hot, and cold, okay? So hot, cold, hot, cold. That's M equals zero. You can also do M equals two. That's horizontal, hot, cold, hot, cold, okay? That's M equals two. And you, now you see the pattern, okay? When M equals M, you're looking at the horizontal, horizontal breakups in the sky. If M equals zero, it's uh, uh, polar, polar division, okay? And M equals not equal to zero or L is somewhere in between, <laughs> okay? Like this, right? And when M equals, N equals M, so this is the uh, one wavelength is blue to blue. Huh? Uh, no, no, uh, no, 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 sorry. Uh, this is the uh, red, blue, red, blue. Uh, what I'm saying? Sorry, no, 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 no. One wavelength is uh, blue to blue, yeah. One wavelength is blue to blue. 
okay? And this is half wavelengths here. In other words, the size of red spot is half wavelengths, okay? Because to have the full wavelengths, you have to go top to top. Angular extent of this is pi over L, exactly. That's how spherical harmonics works. So when L equals M, pi over L is the angle that subtains half wavelengths. And this becomes important later, so keep this in mind. I'll remind you later, of course. L equals three. Then to composing hot, cold, hot, cold, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the, but that's, that's, the same is true. For, for m equals zero, you're decomposing things from north to south, and m equals, m equals three, you're decomposing the horizon. And angle subtended by half a length is still pi over l. Now you get used to spherical harmonics, okay? You're now expert in the spherical harmonics. All right, now, let's calculate something. We had this scalar perturbation coming from gravitational effect, adiabatic initial condition, one third of phi. This thing lives in Cartesian coordinates, okay? It's a three, it depends on three-dimensional space. Temperature fraction we observe, however, lives in a sphere, okay? Imagine that you have three-dimensional gravitational potential, but you're cutting in a sphere. But that's the only thing we can observe. We can observe the entire gravitational potential. We can only observe the things on the last scattering surface. Like, uh, like here. We're observing the uh, sphere, but that's actually sampling plane wave perturbation, which is the gravitational potential. So somehow you need to go from plane wave to spherical waves. But nonetheless, let's first do this inverse transformation of spherical harmonics. You multiply the temperature fluctuation by complex conjugate of the YLM and integrate of the whole sky. Apply that to this, and you get that. Okay, this, is, this thing is just uh, what I wrote there. And I also expanded phi in terms of plane waves. Not spherical waves, plane waves. Three-dimensional plane wave. Q is a three-dimensional Fourier wave number. Okay? What the hell is this? <laughs> it doesn't t tell me anything. Uh, so let's do favor for spherical people. We decompose plane waves into set of spherical waves. You can actually do that. You can uh, assemble a bunch of spherical waves to create plane wave, okay? Called uh, a partial wave decomposition or Rayleigh's formula. You don't actually have to know what this is because we're not gonna use it. But uh, just for the sake of completeness, if you plug this in, you get this answer here. So suddenly, three-dimensional plane wave coefficients are projected onto spherical by spherical Bessel function. What is this thing? <laughs> no one understands. Uh, so before we get, go into better explanation, let me just tell you that this spherical Bessel function uh, looks like this. So you have uh, x and j L x, and let me actually take the square. Then uh, you have L is similar to x. It does that. Okay? So peaks at L equals x and decays. And there's nothing, there's a very sharp cutoff for L less than x. Okay? This means that uh, L equals Q times RL is what you get as a projection, primarily. Remember now, okay? Half wavelength is pi over L. Okay? <laughs> Half wavelength subtains an angle of 
lambda over 2 over distance to the Lasser scattering surface, which is RL. Okay? That's an angle. This subtends pi over L. Okay? Now, since lambda is wavelength, and wavelength is related to wave number by 2 pi over lambda, it works out that L equals Q times RL. So it works out. You know, you have a half wavelength at the last of the surface that subtends an angle lambda over 2 RL. And just how spherical harmonics works for L equals M, you get L equals Q RL. And that's what's given by this. Pure geometry, fine. But you also get all these other peaks. It's not just L equals QL, right? So clearly, there's something more going on. And the reason is, this relationship holds only for M equals L. You have all the other Ms. So, when you look at, and let's imagine that the gravitational potential wells are only one Fourier mode, and change is only z direction, okay? Just like this. Change is only in z direction, we are at the center. We're sampling gravitational potential well on the surface here. If you look at the horizon, gravitational potential wave number goes above, and that's perpendicular to our line of sight. It's just like changes in the horizon, okay? You are sampling the, uh, sampling, you see, line of sight direction is perpendicular to the wave number. There, indeed, half wavelength here, right, gives you L equals QL. But here, geometry works out exactly. But here, half wavelength is actually pretty big, right? So here, you are actually looking at L that's less than Q times RL. X is greater than L, and that's it. That's here. So this corresponds to horizon. All the other peaks correspond to above the horizon, right? So that's how you go from uh, uh, three-dimensional space to L space. But let's, you know, this is just far too complicated, okay? So let's do something simpler. Let's do plane wave. Plane waves are friends of plane waves. When sky is um, small, so let's take a zenith, and I'm not, I'm not interested in now, horizon or anything, I'm only interested in the vicinity of the zenith. There, you can ignore the curvature of the sky, just like we're ignoring the curvature in this room. Once you confine yourself to smaller separation, you can ignore the curvature. And you can now expand the temperature fluctuation near the zenith in a set of two-dimensional Fourier transformation. Like that, you know? Looks more familiar. We don't want to deal with this beast, spectral harmonics. We like this better. L is now the wave number vector in 2D. Theta is the uh, distance from the origin of the flat sky. Then we multiply the both sides by this uh, Fourier factor and integrate. And right hand side is still three dimensional Fourier vector, Fourier transform. But now I'm decomposing Q, which is the perpendicular to the line of sight, and Q that's parallel to the line of sight. And because we're taking flat sky, cosine theta is one, because theta is very, very small. Then suddenly this thing doesn't, de doesn't depend on theta. I can apply this integral only on this thing, on that thing, which gives you a direct delta function. Okay? So you have uh, I, Q perpendicular RL minus L dot theta, and integrating over theta gives you a direct delta function. Now I'm integrating that uh, over Q as well to get this formula. Here, now it's manifest that only 
Q that is perpendicular to our line of sight is giving you L over RL. But other modes, Q parallel, is not giving you that. And because Q is L square of, now Q perpendicular square plus Q parallel square, this thing is always greater than L over RL. Nicely explaining spherical vessel functions that everybody hates. But you don't really need to do this. If you use this formula, then it's really apparent that what's going on. You only project uh, perpendicular modes to the uh, sphere in the simplest, simplest way. Other modes do something else. Then we have this angular power spectrum. So basically, Lm coefficient squared averaged over m because we don't really care what, uh, well, to some extent, to the first order, we assume that the universe is homogeneous isotropic statistically. So when you have the uh, power spectrum, variance of the uh, temperature and isotropy, and I thought to be here, and I thought to be there, and I thought to be there, are the same. You compute the variance there, compute variance there, compute variance there, they're all the same. If you assume that, then you can average over m to get this power spectrum, which is now rotationally invariant, so it doesn't depend on the coordinate system, and it represents the variance per L. Okay, that's a convenient quantity. Now you take Kobe map. What's shown on the middle is a galactic emission. Now you remove that. You don't, you don't want that, right? Take a Fourier transform, spherical harmonic transform, squared amplitude of L, then that's what you get. Data points do not seem depend so much on L. This is what we call scale invariant spectrum. Variance of the temperature power is the same at any angular scales. That's interesting, okay? Um, and I will tell you what this means tomorrow. <laughs> All right? So this is telling you clearly what's happening at the lateral scattering surface. This is, has to be related to the variance of the potential. But how is that related? So that we will start uh, that tomorrow and then move on to, this is a purely gravitational effect, but uh, once you go to small angular scales like W map, you start seeing something completely different, and that's given by sound waves, and we're gonna study in detail tomorrow. Okay?